Having led teams and people for 14 plus years, the most important lesson that I personally live by is understanding what makes each of us tick. And we know engineers don't lack motivation. They are here to do their like, best work. So then how do you take this collective team of individuals who are operating in that synchrony and then drive that force multiplier leverage in the value they can deliver? So here's where, imagine if all of this awesome people were headed in the wrong direction or destination. How would you even know that? Hey everyone, welcome to Dev Interrupted. I'm your co-host, Connor Bronsden. And today I'm joined by Sumruthi Patel. She is the head of engineering for data platform at Stripe, which is one of the most exciting companies in my opinion. Welcome to the show, Sumruthi. Thanks, Connor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I'm really stoked to talk to you. I've wanted to have someone on from Stripe and, and you're such an incredibly interesting leader. Stripe's obviously a mega unicorn. I think everyone in the audience knows a bit about who Stripe is. It's one of the most valuable startups on the planet. You've been with the company almost five years now, correct? Yes, so I'm getting there. Okay, how did you end up at Stripe? Wow, okay, that's a really good question. Uh, I will have to take you a wee bit whirlwinding into my past. Yeah, give me um, the journey. I, uh, so I grew up in Mumbai. I was very fortunate to be raised by parents. My two daughters who taught us that if you worked hard and didn't take any shortcuts to success, the sky was the limit. And that in many ways has sort of determined my career choices, where I am, who I am. Uh, I loved STEM from the beginning, solving puzzles, asking questions, basically being curious about the why, and so got into engineering. Uh, here I did my bachelor's, my master's in computer science, and had a few offers from the financial world in New York, uh, the cities and the Goldman's. But I came to Palo Alto for an interview with VMware, which back then was at the helm of virtualization wave. Blue skies, white fluffy clouds, rolling meadows, they even had horses. Oh, they fooled like you. A <laughs> exactly. It felt like a paradise on earth. Believe it or not, my 20 year old self decided to move for that. Uh, I worked on the hypervisor, I worked on the control plane, I built out the disaster recovery solution uh, for VMware. And by the time I left, I was working on data protection for the cloud. And so along the way, I had learned that I loved bringing the right set of people together to solve these complex, ambiguous, distributed systems problems. However, my career looking back was very methodical in some ways and structured, you know, from the straight A's to engineer, to master's, to management, to senior management. Yeah, you mentioned then, no shortcuts. Exactly, no shortcuts, right? You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta work with the steps. And in large part, my choices were affected by what the environment around me supported. And sometimes, you know, due to my own financial means and responsibilities. And so I, I was always one foot in front of the other. And sometimes maybe even playing it too safe, one might say. And in my early 30s, I came across this book, Mindset, The Growth or the Fixed. And that completely blew my mind. And so my expectations of myself have drastically changed. And therein, my decision to try out since Stripe was motivated largely by that. I took a step down, so to speak, but I have learned so much more since. And I'm proud to say that it was the best decision of my professional life. I absolutely love working at Stripe and we are hiring. So please reach out if you want to learn more. But that in a nutshell is how I got to Stripe. That's a wonderful story. I, I love how you had this shift in your mindset and said, hey, I want to take on this new challenge. And it's clearly paid off for you. That seems like a great lesson for everyone in the audience too, is sometimes it's okay to take that risk and, and say, I want to like challenge myself because that's when you learn the most, it sounds like. Exactly. So Stripe is obviously solving a ton of important problems. And I want to understand your decision-making more in depth about how you decide which problems to solve. You mentioned, you know, growth mindset, which I know is a value for everyone at Stripe. How do you approach engineering resource and bandwidth decision-making around which problems to solve and what to devote time to? Ricardo, that's a really very good question. Extremely top of mind as we are going into our H2 planning and prioritization for my group. Uh, but since you brought up Stripe, let me start with that, which is at Stripe, we're building out this global payment and treasury network to increase the GDP of the internet. And I personally leave the data platform group to be responsible for critical data infrastructure and tooling that supports Stripe's core business money flowing in, money flowing out, key reporting analytics products, uh, and including our own data products like our financial accounting ledger. So as you can imagine, we deal with a variety of business use cases. We deal with a variety of product teams or user cohorts 
who had different degrees of sophistication. So it's a whirling vortex of activity on any given day. And so we're routinely making these important prioritization decisions around which KPI, which performance indicator do we prioritize? Do I focus on optimizing my cost for my data systems or do I secure them for least privilege? Do we prioritize the of our ML engineers or our sales engineering cohort? Do we reduce our own toil or do we provide use of fixing value? So how do we decide which problem to basically solve and then why? And then why, do, why is it important to even pick that right problem? What even makes it right? And so that's how I think about prioritization. To me, it's that key bridge between user value or business value for users to how teams can independently and autonomously work together to even at the individual level driving the entrance of motivation. Because having led teams and people for 14 plus years, the most important lesson that I personally live by is understanding what makes each of us tick. And we know engineers don't lack motivation. These are here to do their like best work. So then how do you take this collective team of individuals who are operating in that synchrony and then drive that force multiplier message in the value they can deliver? So here's where, imagine if all of this awesome people were headed in the wrong direction or destination. How would you even know that? So that's where I would like to think about opportunity cost. Right, let's say you've got finite resources at any point in time. You've got these fixed engineers and you may be like hiring and scaling rapidly. But at that point in time, you just have a fixed number of people. And doing problem B implies that you're not going to solve a different problem. And so that's where I think that for any software company, our engineering talent, their productivity, their efficiency, their impact becomes that force multiplicative leverage. And here, as an org leader, it is especially relevant and top of mind for me as you are leading teams and orgs. Because if you think about it, if you think about the opportunity cost of going down the potentially wrong path, it can be significantly high. So you as a leader then have to take that step back and say, what is your setting? What is the context that you are creating your business in? What are some of your spatial or temporal constraints? or which users do you want to focus on? So what, let me give you an example. In 2021, our Indian government started enforcing their data locality regulation. And we as Stripe decided to capitalize on this opportunity because India is a really solid market uh, for the world. Uh, and several of my data teams dedicated substantial portions of our roadmap to lead this migration. Uh, it required sort of moving parts of our roadmap off. It required working with product engineering teams. It required, it required migrating thousands of data jobs. But it was an engineering-led initiative. And we shipped that on time. We finished our India data locality migration, which enabled Stripe to launch successfully in Indian markets on time with quality and at compliance. So this basically led, leads me to believe that Prioritization is all about solving that right problem at the right time, but also rightly so. And getting this right can then provide that multiplier effect. That's a great example. To your point, this is clearly such a high leverage point for your team. And for, I, I've heard you say this, any software driven company, engineering resources and engineering bandwidth is like the highest leverage point. And it's clear you're, you're thinking through this in like a, a way that has structure to it, where you're not just saying, oh, well, I think it's this. Uh, what's the checklist or process that you use to make that decision about potential opportunity cost and bandwidth? And so I think a checklist would probably sort of be a cop out in some ways. I think what is very useful is then to think about the systems. As an odd leader, you have some business that you are driving. Uh, I like to go over my checklist, which is, where is your product in its life cycle? Let's say you're offering, I'm offering data platform. I have two core pillars of the product, which is my big data infrastructure, which is in its product maturity stage. And so here our users care a lot about some of the core fundamentals like security, efficiency, reliability, performance. Whereas my event-driven ecosystem is in its high growth phase, uh, where here our users want better interop, they want to force multipliers where this works very closely with big data, for example, uh, where 
Our bruises are not falling off sharp cliffs. So the thing to think about as a leader are, where is your product strategy? Where in its life cycle is it? Is it in its high growth? Is it in its maturity? Is it in its decline? And accordingly, how much do you then want to invest in it? So the big thing for me to start off with is what is the setting of the business that you are providing value for? Once you have that, you then take a look at what is happening around you in the environment. And this is where some of those temporal constraints come into play, like the India data locality of the regulation. There could be a time where you, you have that early more advantage that you really want to start reaping. Uh, and you're, you need to be then cognizant of what is the go-to-market time that you absolutely have to comply with. So there are some temporal constraints, for example. It could also be that you are in that stage where you need strategic investment to improve the power of your own teams because they are either burning out, keeping the systems going, but you haven't had a chance to. So whether to derive user-facing value or to focus on your own goal. So to read the checklist is figure out your setting as a leader to begin with. What are your spatial and temporal constraints that you absolutely must comply with? What are your must-haves in terms of your users? And there it's all about the people, the people, the people. Right? Who are the people that you're building for? And give you an example of data platform, we had six different cohorts uh, with varying degrees of sophistication. And we said, hey, we can either clean up butter ourselves and make everyone sort of partially happy, or we can sort of double down on our ML engineers and our data scientists and make them be a lot more productive. But that then required us to very consciously, very intentionally say no to a couple other cohorts to avoid that. So to me, that checklist is all about understanding the broader context of the business that you're operating in. What is the state of your systems? What is the state of your teams? Do you have the skill set on your own team to meet the strategic investments you have to try? And lastly, then making sure that you intentionally make it out for this seems to align with a concept that I've heard some engineering leaders talk about recently around making sure you don't have too much different work in progress at one time to enable focus and reduce potential context switching. I mean, this has so many benefits, right? Like it'll enable people to get in the flow state, but it also makes sure that if you're trying, you understand, I would guess more quickly of if I'm actually solving the right problem because you're moving along and you can say, okay, we, if we need to pivot, if we need to rescope even and say like, we have more work than we thought we did. Uh, do you agree with that kind of concept of like, okay, let's, let's make sure our team's focused and try to avoid that context switching too? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm a big proponent of uh, the space framework and how it drives Same. engineering team velocity, agility, because you can have a lot of your teams set up to have the right OKRs and the right goals. The question is the macro. What is the product strategy? What is the tech strategy that you want to have? What is your North Star? And so when I think about that business value and the setting, it is more about driving precision toward the North Star. How do you define the why very accurately? And once you've defined that why, how do you then have your teams moving with agility where you're not sort of peanut buttering across 10 different sub initiatives to get to that North Star? And we very really rightly called out work in progress there or flow time that engineers have to focus on deep work. And again, space captures it very beautifully for the various aspects of the build, the test, the deploy, the deliver of a certain problem. And that drives engineering team velocity a lot. And this is more about the speed, the quality of how engineering teams are actually shipping software. So work in progress is definitely something very core to driving folks for your teams too. Have you gone in depth on the, I guess, the pre-shipping process? So we think a lot about coding time. How are you thinking about the processes around, like, uh, I don't know if you're using PRs and review time, or is that something that you view as like a blocker for some of your teams or something you're, you're focusing on um, as far as your metrics? And I see here you're using space, which kind of sees the downstream effects of that process. Right. So a lot of my focus, because data platform has a very wide surface area at Stripe, has been around providing the right broader framework for a group. We are a group of about 150 plus ICs, EMs, and manager of managers. Uh, and to me, as a leader of a group of the sizes, how do you provide the right guardrails for the group and at the same time balance it 
with enough agency and autonomy to empower long teams to make those decisions. And in this, I've actually seen two different models. I've seen the, at one end of the spectrum, you have a top-down model. There's a leader that can say, here are the 43 things I need you to do. And right, improve so on I this see, and that. I improve on this and then that. And then so I see well, how are we shipping code and checking the PRs and all of that. The downside of this is a human brain can at most capture seven to eight things. And it also at the very worst end of that spectrum is it takes some of the agency away. And I as a leader might not have visibility into what the teams know on the day to day. And the other end of the spectrum is teams bottom up deciding what their roadmap looks like, what their stack rank list of project looks like, and what their cut line looks like based on what they think they can deliver within a certain half. Now, the downside of that approach is if you sort of zoom out, you could be in a state where each team has made the correct decision. They've made the locally right decision. It is I as a reader zoom out and say, hey, what is collective impact from this body of people? And are we delivering the right business value for our users? Do I feel like I Swiss cheese my impact across the group? And so what is important then, what I feel valuable is this Goldilocks middle, where you provide this investment portfolio to say, hey, given where our product is, given the temporal constraint, given that we will focus on cohort A versus cohort B, Here's what our investment portfolio of sorts looks like for the next half. We'll spend about 20% on poor reliability uh, because the holidays are coming, they're clearly here. So how do you do your game leads, your reliability, how's your systems and your infrastructure up to speed? How do you do those fire drills? So about 20 to 30% on reliability. We're supporting a fintech and financial data. So we obviously have to have core focus on security and data governance. How do we also make sure our cost on data systems is growing slower than that of the business? And there's about 10 to 15% of that. Having said that, we do want to invest strategically for the future. And we have about 20 to 25% of our collective portfolio investing in new innovative solutions for the future. And so with that as guardrails, where I have this top-down investment portfolio, and also a what we will not do list, we then empower the teams to come up with what are the right strategic investments? And once I have that in play, coming back to your question of what is the pre ship routine that I track, uh, we have this process of regular execution reviews where we track how is engineering developing against the OKRs that we signed up for, and also operational metrics to see hey, did we run ourselves into a lot of incidents? Is our major burden of run or keeping up that we also need to pay attention to? The typical thing with ops metrics is they come in from the left and all your planned execution work can have a tendency to go off rails if you haven't paid enough attention. So to me, the checks and balances are more in terms of the processes put in place for engineering groups and teams to then independently operate. I love that because I'm sure that teams feel empowered by that and it helps to give them a sense of ownership of their work and probably improves code quality, improves speed to value, and it probably improves, I would assume, team morale across the board. Exactly. And, and you rightly called out that it is all about that fostering the agency and autonomy at the team level to say, are we enabling folks to work on the right problems? And one thing I like to do <clears throat> as the sniff test is in the weekly ops review, check for pager burden run toy and say, hey, this particular team seems to be having a lot of pager burden. How are our engineers doing? Is there burnout on the team? What are our plans to make strategic investment? But it does give teams the agency to co-control their destiny. Fascinating. I can definitely hear that you've thought through these processes and I, I love the insights you're providing around prioritizing bandwidth and providing teams not only uh, their own opportunities to make decisions, but also accountability around that and structures to support them. I'm a big fan of the space framework as well. And it's, it's so important to consider your developer experience and make sure that people are feeling empowered in the work. And I also know that you're thinking about trade-offs around this, around bandwidth. We talked a bit, a little bit about it earlier. And I, I've heard you say previously that some of the hardest decisions you've had to make are around trade-offs and when to pivot teams. Once you're confident in the problem that you're solving and you've empowered teams to make decisions as well, how do you ensure you're making the right trade-offs to get there? 
Yes, Kanada. All I'm saying is short is it is hard. Trade-offs are very hard and they hurt. We talked about how we assessed your way of producting your businesses. You know, what is your product strategy? What is your technical strategy? The spatial temporal constraints you're operating under. Uh, and the time horizon that you want to plan for. Do you want to optimize for the next six months? Do you want to optimize for the next 18 months? Or the three plus years? Uh, you've also identified the right use of cohorts for optimal reach. And so using your tech strategy, your North Star metrics, your guardrails for what you will do, you basically have decided what problems to solve at the macro levels. And here, like I gave you the example, we consciously had to deprioritize two user cohorts and double down on ML. And this required a micro level trade off where we said, hey, team A would no longer solve problems uh, for business intelligence, but they'd instead be more focused on data productivity to make it truly. So I, as a leader, need some micro level trade offs. But how do I then empower my teams to do the same? For the problem space that sits within this macro problem trade off. Okay? And here's where I think a lot about the fostering of autonomy that we talked about. Uh, how do you do this when your org or your team uh, is of size six to an organization of size 60 to maybe if you're leading a company of 600? How do you sort of scale that as your group is scaling? How do you scale your autonomy? How do you dedicate your scope, your responsibility, and even your authority? so that your teams can make the same decisions and independently operate, which otherwise you would. So I need that infrastructure team. And so I routinely encourage my group to proactively reach out to other teams at Stripe. Uh, anyone who works with data to say, hey, what prioritization conversations are we going to need going into this planning cycle? Are we going to talk about transferring ownership of a system or a service? Does it involve building an API or an interface? So how do we have encourage our teams to focus on the what, the when, and the how? Like you said, we figured out the why, we figured out which problems to solve and why. And here my 3.3 work is discover, evaluate, and then decide. So let me tell you a little bit about what I mean here. This is what where you're understanding your problem, the constraints, and you're seeking that alignment with your users. We're lucky because a lot of our users are actually internal, so we can tap into them to see their own feedback. But the first step of figuring out, is this problem worth solving? How to sort of scope it is understanding and discovering what are your users trying to do? Why are they aren't looking for this problem to be solved? And here's where what I've found is you need to check yourself because it can be easy to fall into mind traps or biases to say, hey, Team X is always asking us to do this and they have no idea how hard our lives are. Uh, but check yourself, focus on the learning. So the step one of discovery is just learn what your users are trying to do, where are they struggling? And once you know that, understand your constraints. What is the scope of the problem? What is the timeline that uh, you need the solution to exist by? What is the quality? Is there any give? This is basically asking what is your own cap theorem like? Uh, what are your must-haves? What are your deal breakers? Uh, are any of these constraints soft or negotiable? Or on another axis, can you sort of plot them between urgent and important? And giving you my own example, for the event stack that we talked about, which is the new innovative way of sort of solving for data at Stripe, uh, we go backwards from how product and applications were building their services. And we started with stubbing out APIs that they could leverage. And in the process, we unlocked them and then scope the project in line with those milestones. So you want to, based on that, assess what you can choose to not do. And if you didn't do something, what would the downstream implications be? And that journey then takes you to say, who are the people that care about the problem that is being solved? Who is responsible and accountable for the outcome? Who needs to be informed? Who even needs to be consulted? Or let's say you are rolling out a backward and compatible change. Who might then be affected if you're rolling this out? So the key part of discovery is for establishing that bridge or channel of communication that you can keep tapping into for feedback loop. As you go into the second one, which is evaluating your alternatives. When you know what the problem is and you know what the constraints are, the two things that you want to think about as a leader are scope and resources. 
How do you solve it? How do you correctly scope your problem? Is there an 80 20 where you can solve for the biggest impact? And then you can sort of have a plan for the long term. We had this problem we were solving for in terms of data ownership, where we didn't know who owned what data. And so things like land retention policies, applying our access and governance policies was a big problem two, three years ago. However, we decided to focus on the core big ticket items on who owned the most data. And focusing on the 80-20, we came up with a plan which then works out to us getting to almost 100% of data ownership today. What I also found very useful is drawing this two by two matrix of ease of execution versus the impact to get to see like if, what is the ROI for how much I'm putting in, how much I'm getting instead. And that brings us to resources or the number of engineers we have. Can you here get creative in terms of adding engineering bandwidth to the problem such that you're actually solving it? One core problem we had was solving for our optimizations optimizing for the cost of our data systems. And here we decided to ring fence a bunch of folks to say, hey, how do we give a fast swim lane to this problem so that we can net net increase our throughput? So the three phases are discover where we're doing our learning, we evaluate where we're evaluating alternatives. And then the last but the most critical thing about trade-offs is making that decision and then explaining and communicating it. Like the why did you make this decision? What is the impact of it? Who's going to be impacted in communicating it? And this to me is a very crucial step because it sort of closes the loop with your users, your stakeholders, and sort of lines up all the ducts. And in hindsight, I found it very valuable because it actually helps build that trust and credibility with whoever is the recipient. I love the way you're thinking through the framework and your use of examples in each step because it makes it really clear that you have ways to pivot and adjust it to the different stages. As, as you mentioned at the start of it, you know, I'm sure you think about pivoting these teams and adjusting trade-offs differently when it's a team that has a near-term delivery point versus something that's like a three-year bet where it's, hey, we're looking at this innovation space in two or three years. What are some of the particular ways that you uh, adjust the framework for those teams depending on the speed they have to have to value? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and to me, what I've found is there is no silver bullet in terms of finding out what is needed by them. Ah, I was hoping you'd just have a, have a way. You'd be like, oh, here's how. This is how to do it this way. <laughs> yeah, so for me, I think it turns down to users, 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 right? Uh, which is what are our users asking for? The big challenge I've found here is which users to focus on them. And that's where you again anchor on the business impact, which is by transitivity, what business impact do those users have? Like giving you a concrete example, even within our ML engineers and data scientists, there were some prioritization asks which, which had a priority inversion. Like ML wanted something which was P0, DS wanted something which was P2. And for us, we're like, okay, do we solve for both? Which is needed when? And, and to your question of, you know, how do you know whether to solve it for the short term or the long term? It is a lot about that discovery process, working with each user, and then the alternative space, where you keep doing that loop a couple of times to then focus on net net, how do you feel about the impact you get to try. Have you seen an impact from the current macroeconomic environment into how you're thinking about these trade-offs? Has it made any changes into how you're applying the framework? Yes, that is a very, very good question. And the current, unfortunately, the current macroeconomic conditions are turning bearish. And what that then means for me as a leader operating data infrastructure is what is the operational efficiency that we are driving in terms of ensuring that A, the cost of our data systems is growing much slower than the business, right? This is the cost of goods sold. Uh, is it growing sublinear? And in that, I'm extremely proud of the work uh, my group has recently shipped, which actually has been the curve of our spend on data systems. Some of the cost efficiencies we've recently delivered are going to sort of show confounded over the next three to four years. So one of the big things was how were we strategic last half to focus on some of that work, which we are now reaping, uh, knowing 
not knowing that the market is really going to turn. So that is one positive example of looking ahead, so to speak, in terms of what is the risk. And then what has helped is always having an eyesight on or focus on where are we bleeding. So doing that SWOT analysis, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what are your opportunities, what are your threats. And this time, sometime last year, we sat down and said, hey, the cost of our data systems is growing faster than our business. The usage of data is growing exponentially. This was about a year and a half ago. What are we strategically invest in? So specific to the current economy or the conditions that are changing around us, what is holding us well is some of the seeds that we sowed the year before last and last year, uh, which at least take care of the cost and operational efficiency. The second big leverage point is Stripe is a fintech and there are naturally going to be things like credit intelligence, risk intelligence, foreign intelligence. And so how are we ensuring that this is the best in class platform? And consequently, as we focus on this cohort of users within Stripe, what do they in turn need from data platform that we want to prioritize? And so within H2's planning, my group has worked very closely with our peers in product engineering on those teams to say what parts of their roadmap can we help accelerate by pivoting the right data platform folks. And it sounds like one of the big takeaways from the framework you're applying and the way you're thinking through this is that these intentional conversations you're having to align with product, to align with sales, to align across the company are making sure that no one's caught by surprise too. So even when you have to adjust decision-making or say, hey, we're, we're pre-prioritizing on these short-term things now because we have to fix these problems. You're building trust across the org because they are aware of the process and they see the business context that you're applying to it. Yes, absolutely, Carl. And it is two-way. To me, the, the biggest value I have is that discovery phase where we are in the trenches, building together, learning together, and shipping together, uh, and ensuring that we are aligned in the precision of which problem to solve. We've got that bridge of trust and credibility, you know, that rock solid foundation from the get-go where we know what the users are trying to do, the business outcome they are driving. And so doing that discovery together. And it has that second advantage for our own teams where they are being able to exhibit the user's first mindset. Uh, quite often as we're engineering things, we, we tend to be focused on solutions and you know, the why is about two steps away. And this gives our teams and, and down to the engineers this direct line or connection to how does your day-to-day -day work impact the business? How do you sort of join the dots into what you ship and the value it brings? And being in that discovery and evaluation phase together has that knock-on effect even on the teams and down to the individuals. This brings up a point that we've touched on a little bit, but I would love to drill down into. How do you motivate your teams at Stripe? God, this is what I, I love. I love how excited you just got. This is great. Okay, this is great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think to me, my so I've been leading teams for 14 years now, and I'll tell you the single biggest thing that gives me joy is, is working with a diverse set of smart, talented engineers and then solving problems for our users. And I think here's where typically what I have learned is what I've seen is when we talk about high performance, uh, whether individuals or teams, a line view can be to imagine, you know, a bunch of developers just burning a midnight oil, shipping faster, writing more code. Uh, but over the last two decades, I personally have worked as an engineer, then a manager, and now an org leader. And leading these diverse teams, it to me comes down to these two important concepts. One is about the intrinsic motivation. And I strongly believe that engineers don't lack motivation. They're here to do their best work. So the work for me then as a leader is how do I create that environment for engineers to sort of come together and work that magic. And this is again, the second concept which blew my mind is about thinking in systems by Donella Meadows. This talks about how for any system, you want to figure out the set of elements and how they interconnect, and then the function or the purpose that that system aims to solve. So you brought up high performance. I mean, whether at the individual level or at the team level, 
When you think about it, it goes beyond that practical stuff of sprints and story points and OKRs and PRs. Uh, to me, it comes down to things that we've already talked about, right? The business success, which is what is a team shipping, what are you building and why? That precision and impact about the higher order not star. How are we contributing? How are we contributing? And that comes to that body of individuals, the team success, which is how well are that set of individuals working together? How are they communicating? How are they collaborating? How are they effectively shipping goal with agility, autonomy, and high agency? And then that comes down to the individual level, which is how engaged and motivated are individuals on that team? Are they growing and stretching themselves? And so at the heart of it, as leaders, how do we create those fertile, inclusive environments based on safety, psychological safety, growth mindset, and value candor? So here the framework that I typically routinely uh, deploy is the EAR framework, PPR for listening, explore, align, and reinforce. Through regular one-on-ones with folks on my team and my managers do the same, understand individual strengths what are the areas of interest? What are the career aspirations? And then match that to what team or business delivers. The third bit in the strike factor is depending on the org you're working in, what are the systemic expectations or career frameworks? Some have it the career wheel, some have the career ladder, but how do you sort of make sure as you're exploring with the individual, what are the kind of opportunities they are going to take on? And we need to then make meet the career aspirations with the team and the business opportunities to sustain the expectations. Like if you have a staff engineer, a staff engineer at company A is not going to have the same expectation that staff engineer at company B. So how do you calibrate those expectations and make sure that the individual on your team is aware of that? So the first step is exploration where you learn where the individual is in their career and provide your own context, both about the team, the business, and the system's expectation, and then aligning all the expectations and goals to say, okay, I ask my senior EMs and the engineers to write up this personal charter on what they would like to drive. Like, imagine you are a year into the future. What would you be super proud of having shipped? And so once you've done that exploration and aligned, and then reinforce this through regular one-on-ones by giving them feedback on things that are positively improving, you know, how do you recognize and how do you motivate them, and then rinse and repeat. Interesting. I also heard that you led an initiative at Stripe around the self-evaluation process during performance cycles. Can you dive deeper into that? I love this focus that you're taking on. Yeah, absolutely, Carlos. That That is something I was very proud of. Uh, it was... It was my version of FAS, which is feedback as a service. Uh, so at Stripe, we have the performance evaluation, which has three phases. You have the self-review process where you write about how your half or how your quarter was. Uh, you then run into this peer feedback or manager evaluation, where your peers do your 360. Your manager writes an evaluation about uh, how the individual performed. And then you sort of get together as a group of managers or as an org leader to calibrate and make sure that we are sort of systemically ensuring that the bar is consistently high and then providing uh, every engineer or every manager the feedback that they need. And as I was reading individual evaluations, the thing that I noticed most was there is tendency for my ICs, individual contributors, to write their evaluation in the terms of what they had done. For example, they're like, I optimized my garbage collector and shipped so and so project. But what did that do uh, for everyone else? What did that exactly got it? What did that do? Right. So focusing on the impact, focusing on the outcome. And I had a before version and an after version of the same evaluation to say, okay, why did it matter? Right. Do your five Y exercise. Uh, and one one awesome process which I love at Stripe is this pre-shift where you now encourage your engineers, even before you write your first line of code, is to write a pre-shift of what would actually get better. What would it look like? I love and Amazon that. does the PRFAQ style process, especially if you're going through multi-quarter or multi-half long big initiatives. 
you want to ensure you get that early buy-in and alignment that this is indeed something everybody cares about, but also for the engineer to be proud and feel accomplished. Comes back to the motivation thing they, you talked about. Yeah, exactly. How does that relate to what you are shipping? And so to me, focusing even the individual evaluation and assessment to be impact and outcome driven, not so much the, you know, what did I check in? You're building a um, mindset throughout the whole process. I love that. That's super smart. Exactly. Um, and then it actually, it was surprising for me to see the aha and the eyes light up for the individuals. I then did a review, you know, 15 to 30 minute review with each of them. I had about 18 show up um, and the before after story, they're like, wow, I didn't realize that this was the impact or value of what I've achieved. Uh, and how it you know, moved the needle for the overall business. So, so that internal satisfaction to me was you know, the cherry on the cake, so to speak. And I think that aligns with something you mentioned earlier about the intrinsic motivation of engineers. And it sounds like you have like a belief in what that intrinsic motivation is. Yes, absolutely. To me, it is all, you know, the theory also talks about competence, autonomy, and purpose. The purpose is the why, the North Star. Here's where as an org leader, you want to figure out your business value. You have the competence. This is about through radical candor, through ensuring that you're giving engineers a safe space to take risks if you need to, to take innovate, uh, to innovate when needed. And even the psychological safety to keep giving that feedback through radical candor is super crucial to ensure that folks are learning they're growing and they've been stretching themselves. And so another conversation I love having with folks on my team is what does a stretch opportunity look like? And these are things which won't, which will stretch you, not break you. So you also want to be mindful about that and having those routinely with a, imagine you're one year into the future. What would you be proud of? What would stretch you? What would challenge you? What do you think you can't do or, you're, or that brings discomfort? Let's explore that. But the core thing about all these conversations is, you know, the foundation of solid trust both ways, uh, where my team knows I'm playing on their side, working with them, but also ensuring that the guardrails we have around us are aligned with users and the business. How does this all fit together then around career development? So they're helping to find, hey, here's where I want to go in a year or two. And then they're also looking at the outcomes they're driving with the work they're doing, how do you then align that with, okay, maybe what's their next promotion or, or what's their career path? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, this is where I like to, I talked about the trifecta of uh, individual aspirations where different individuals are at different stages in their life. There is no cookie cutter approach to career development. Um, some folks love where they are in their career and they want to keep doing the same work. There are some folks who are like, hey, I, I want to stretch myself. Maybe I want to go from being an individual contributor to managing managers. Whereas some managers are like, hey, I want to do more deep work. I want to be a TNM shaped person, not an org leader managing multiple teams. And so understanding where each is in their careers is at the core part of that exploration that you are doing with them. And then ensuring that as you are defining your future product strategy, remember you're trying to be two steps ahead in many ways. And you're thinking about what is coming up next, right? What is my 18 month roadmap? What is my three year roadmap? As you as a leader are doing that, you will identify areas where you want to ask, do you have the right bench for it? And that's where when you have your recall list of knowing who cares about what, who's stretching, who's trying to stretch, who has the skill set, who's looking for those opportunities, you can then sort of line that up with the future that you know is coming. Lining up both the career development, but also the long-term business or the product strategy you're trying. I really appreciate the context you brought to this conversation because I can tell that you not only are, are saying, oh, I have these processes, but you're giving like clear examples and in every piece of the process, you're driving back to the business context. And I can hear that in the way you're communicating this process. It's been a really fascinating conversation. And I have to say, like, it's motivated me. I'm like, oh, wait, you're hiring on your team? Like, what am I doing here? I love this podcast. But if folks want to find out more, I know you've got a bunch of open roles at Stripe overall on your team, particularly, where should they go? What, what, what would you, how would you pitch them on? Like, come join my team beyond this whole podcast. 
Uh, yes, I think the biggest sell would be come join Stripe. We're building the GDP of the internet. Stripe's hiring. Uh, I personally am super excited about where our data platform group is going. We are solving problems for the future of building out Stripe's core payment infrastructure, building out our reporting analytics products, and also solving a lot of problems at scale that is not only coming, but in many ways here. Um, so you can reach out to me. I think the two big takeaways before I go into that is also, we talked today a lot about prioritization at the org level and the framework for individuals and teams to operate in autonomy and synchrony. But the biggest thing I have learned is to just have that conversation, make the time, create the space for it. Because as you're having that conversation, you are also driving clarity by making those intentional trade-offs and acknowledging that sometimes we might not be the easiest conversation to have, but having them, it helps build that partnership. It helps you as a leader with trust and with empathy. So close the loop, be explicit about the decisions you're making, own them as hard as they may be and communicate them. And if you wanna solve some super exciting problems, come join me and the team. All right, how should they get in touch? LinkedIn, please. LinkedIn is the best way. I'll share my LinkedIn handle. Awesome. And I'm Smriti at Stripe. Fantastic. Well, definitely encourage folks who are listening, who are excited about this conversation, want to take on a new challenge, check out what Smriti is doing at Stripe and, and reach out over LinkedIn. I think uh, sounds like an amazing team to work on. I also want to just say thank you to everyone for listening to this conversation and to the more than 3,000 of you who are now subscribed to our weekly interruption newsletter where we bring you articles from the community, inside information on our weekly podcasts, and the first look at Interact 3 on October 25th, uh, which I'm super excited to have Smriti back for. That's going to be so so much fun. Super we're still, excited, Connor. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Yeah, this has, <laughs> been, this has been really interesting. So like, this has fired me up even more because I, like, I've had this great conversation with you. And I'm like, oh, she's going to bring so many fantastic insights to us. Interact, if you haven't been already, we're going to have over 2,000 engineering leaders and engineers in attendance. Uh, we've got an incredible lineup planned for you. It's all free. It's going to be a ton of fun. It's online. Very easy. Register today. We'll have a link in the show description. We're going to go to devinterrupted.com slash interact. And uh, Simruthi, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Connor, for having me. It was an excellent time talking to you. <laughs>